it's about time. Let's get started. How are you guys? Good? Um, thanks for joining. Uh, I'm Smith, uh, and I work at Dubizel. And today, I'm going to talk about uh, Dubizel's journey uh, of moving a legacy code base to a microservice architecture. I'll talk about what challenges we faced, uh, what mistakes we made, and how we got out of them, and our current state, and where we are today. So yeah, let's get started. A little bit about me. Uh, so as I said, I, I work for Dubizel. I also run a consulting company called Zypher uh, in my part time. It provides uh, services for building apps and websites. Uh, you can check out our website, zypher.tech. Uh, I also contributed very little to open source. Uh, I started my career working at Red Hat, and I contributed to some projects of Gluster. I also contributed to uh, NG UI autocomplete plugin in past. Uh, and uh, I used to run a community uh, called GDG Gandhinagar when I was in India. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much about me. To know more, you can uh, check out my GitHub. Or if you want to connect, we can always connect on LinkedIn. So let's get started. Um, just to give you a little bit idea of what Dubizel is, uh, Dubizel is a, class, a number one classifieds website in UAE. Uh, we, uh, we have users who are trying to sell their wardrobes, washing machines, to you know some cool stuff like uh, Boeing 747 or dinosaur skeleton. And actually, this dinosaur skeleton was sold for 24 million dollars, and it is one of the uh, very nice thing that was sold on Dubizel in the history. Uh, we have people selling their yachts, everything. So it's in Dubai. So you know, uh, antiques, yachts, everything, anything that money can buy, <laughs> people sell it on Dubizel. Uh, we operate at a massive scale of uh, 3.5 million monthly active users. And every minute, 20 new ads are placed on the platform. Uh, uh, so we help our users to uh, find houses, cars, uh, jobs, and used items. And our business is structured along these verticals. And each vertical at Dubizel acts like its own independent startup and is empowered to deliver value and act fast. So to summarize as an organization, what we believe in is to empower teams to sustainably deliver value. So to, in order to sustainably deliver value, uh, teams should have access to all the tools that are required to solve any problem. Uh, teams should be able to experiment and iterate fast on the solutions that they make. And this solution should be data back and effective to our users. The team those that builds the technologies should be able to own it. And the system should be there in place uh, in order to support it. Uh, so these are the requirements for us to you know, deliver value uh, fast and in an independent manner. So just to give you a little bit historical context about Dubizel, uh, it was started in 2005. This was back when uh, George Bush uh, started serving as the president of United States for the second time, and the first ever video was uploaded on YouTube. Uh, it was started off by uh, two American guys uh, who saw the market opportunity to build a platform in UAE. Uh, there was no Craigslist at, at that time in UAE. So yeah, they built Dubizel. It used to look like this, and it was the initial version was outsourced to a company, and it was built with one of the most sophisticated technology of that time called Adobe Flash. As you can see, the concept of individual c categories have been there since uh, the very first day. Uh, but when we started, we were only operating in one city called Dubai. Uh, yeah. Uh, so in 2010. Uh, uh, movie Inception was released, and we launched in another city called Abu Dhabi. Uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, you might have seen Abu Dhabi in uh, Mission Impossible Fallout. Uh, so Abu Dhabi is an emirate. It's uh, also a city. It's also a state and a country within the country, because in Dubai there is no city or states. Uh, it's an emirate, and an emirate has its own laws and blah blah blah. So yeah. 
uh, as you can see, there was a huge difference in time between when we first launched and when we launched in another city. Uh, it was because not a lot of VC funding was available in the region at that time, and the co-founders were hustling to get the platform up and running. Uh, and then in 2011, uh, we decided to launch in other MENA regions like Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and the website had to be localized. Uh, the features uh, had to be tweaked as per uh, the market sophistication of these regions. Some features had to be turned on and turned off as per uh, different regions because of the laws or, uh, or how the people adapted the platform. Uh, and uh, some features were acting differently. We had different pricing models. And this all led to some spaghetti code base. Uh, uh, also, Dubai being a difficult region to hire, engineers were learning at their jobs. Uh, and as you can see, this could easily get out of hand, especially when you are uh, thinking about operating at a scale uh, uh, of more than a million users and when you are thinking about operating in multiple regions. So to get out of this, what we decided was to uh, create a whole new platform for these emerging markets. And this was when uh, the micro microservices era was just starting. And uh, our research recommended us to build CRUD APIs that are REST-based. And we went API crazy. For every new service that we built, uh, we built it in form of CRUD APIs. That brings us to CRUD APIs. The frameworks like Django, Ruby on Rails, promote CRUD and support CRUD out of the box. And yeah, we built CRUD APIs. But what we didn't realize was when we built CRUD APIs, the business logic sweeps into the client. Also, uh, uh, the dogma of CRUD APIs uh, grets based CRUD APIs opens up a lot of discussions, uh, like, uh, for example, to feature an ad, should we send a put request uh, to feature the ad or create a new feature resource via post request? Uh, different engineers have different opinions, and this could lead to a lot of fragmentation. And also, just the fact that business logic is in the client, it is prone to reverse engineering. Uh, though at that time, luckily, we had some security policies, uh, rate limiting, etc., in place. Uh, but uh, still, uh, having business logic in client is a, can be a nightmare. Testing can be, get difficult because the logic will be implemented differently across all the platforms. And you might notice different behaviors. Uh, refactoring code uh, on the client side uh, can be easy, but refactoring these REST APIs can be difficult uh, because uh, uh, if you update one API, you have to update on all the platforms. Doing that on web is uh, possible, but doing that on mobile is impossible because not all of your users uh, will update the API. So you have to start thinking about backwards compatibility for your CRUD APIs. Uh, uh, we realized that when we build CRUD APIs, it forces us to think in terms of DB operations. But what we are creating actually is a layered architecture across network, across code bases. Developing a feature is equivalent to touching multiple code bases and multiple platforms. It is important to think in a way holistically how these things uh, and different parts uh, will interact with each other. And then uh, we had another problem. So after a few years, our architecture looked like this. Uh, and it, it helped us uh, to be fast by being separate. But with every new service that we built, we were increasing the load on our monolith. The idea behind running on cloud is to scale horizontally, right? Uh, but uh, it this architecture was forcing us to scale vertically. Uh, also. Uh, uh, failure in, let's say, uh, layer, which is a chat uh, ser third party chat service that we have, to the, the chat service internal, to the mobile service, to the monolith, uh, the failure might propagate and could potentially bring the whole website down. Uh, the, the, there are single points of failure, and the failures propagate throughout the system, and we can only trace these dependencies uh, till, uh, till we notice a failure. Uh, and we wanted to look ahead of time. 
so after two to three years of doing this, uh, we had to take a step back uh, because every task on our product roadmap was either too big or way too big because the time to deliver uh, these features or the maintenance of these features were very high. Microservices gives you speed, but we were not getting any speed. Uh, uh, we had release pipelines, we had containers running in production, et cetera, but we were not getting any speed. Being fast is one of our core values, and teams are structured to be independent. Inde independent teams are structured to act, work independently, but we were not getting speed, we were not getting any independence, uh, and we were very dependent on each other uh, to do stuff. Monolith, our monolith being a single point of failure could potentially bring all the verticals down. We were promised to take us to the moon, uh, but we couldn't get out of Brno. And this brings us to 2017. Uh, we thought it is time to uh, revisit our culture and methodologies. Uh, so we came up, up, came up with a set of guiding principles. We went back to our drawing board to understand what we are doing wrong and how can we get better and what we can change. We attended a lot of conferences, built POCs, uh, did a lot of unlearnings and learnings and reading to help us uh, to make our way forward. After this entire process, uh, we came up with a set of guiding principles uh, that we could keep in mind uh, when architecting uh, the systems in future and uh, uh, re-architect uh, our existing uh, platform uh, so these principles are inspired from a book called Domain Driven Design by Eric Evans uh, and, uh, this, uh, and are adapted to the way we work. Uh, the gist of this principle tells you is to model your system in a way how it acts in real world. Uh, we will talk about these principles uh, in uh, future slides. Uh, the first five principles tells you what to do, and the other five, last five principles tells you how to do. So the first one is low coupling and high cohesion. Uh, we always thought that users and ads are the two main entities. As you can see from our previous architecture, this is very ev evident. So we built ad API and uh, user API to solve all our problems. Uh, but not really. What we didn't realize is uh, that uh, the entire context of ad is, uh, the entire ad uh, information is not relevant in all the context. For example, the person who is looking at an ad will be interested in title, images, descriptions, etc. The person who is uh, 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 placing an ad might be interested in the boost packages, the promotion package, package information, his credits, quality score of the ad, etc. Since these contexts are completely uh, different, they can be decoupled and the communication within this context can only happen via predefined touch point. This way, we can minimize the impact surface area if any of the context goes down. For example, uh, if uh, the place and ad service uh, or place and ad context goes down, uh, the users who will be browsing the ad will not be affected. The next one is no service can depend on another for uptime, functionality, and data availability. Uh, teams are independent, and we need to be we need to optimize for the independence of team in order to be truly fast. Success and failures of team should not be coupled with one another. Uh, team A's performance should not affect team B's performance. For example, uh, as you can see uh, in our previous architecture, we built uh, user API and add API. So if we continue with this, that example, and uh, we add one more service uh, called chat email notification service. Uh, this service uh, will be responsible for sending the unread, uh, notification for unread chat messages. Now, this service would require the listing title. What if listing service goes down? Uh, the team will, with KPI engagement will also be affected. Uh, a serv uh, let's take one more example. Uh, we have a service uh, or uh, we have a feature where user can, uh, you know, uh, perform a search and then save that search and uh, ask Drupal to send search alerts. And doing this uh, requires us to scan the database and see what new ads are placed on the platform after a given point in time. 
uh, and send the emails to user. Doing this is a very database intensive operation, but the performance of any feature should not be affected by doing this, right? Uh, so instead, if via message bus uh, or any mechanism, uh, we asynchronously uh, t uh, take this data, store it locally somewhere, or cache it, and then use it when sending notification or when sending search alerts. This way, uh, if, uh, if uh, a listing service is down, still uh, the people, the other team's KPI won't be hurt, right? Uh, the next one is one transaction can span at most at one service. Uh, so as you know, we, op we operate in Dubai, uh, and it's a difficult place to hire. We don't have any PhDs in our office. Uh, so as a rule of thumb, what we decided was uh, to not do any distributed transactions till we get a PhD. Uh, many times, uh, you are de developing a feature, and you need to interact with multiple services. For example, in this case, uh, we have a functionality of placing an ad, uh, a f uh, browsing ad, and then favoriting an ad on our platform. Uh, here, the favorite service uh, is the source of truth for the favorite information. But when you are browsing and ad, br looking at the same ad again, the listing uh, detail view should also show you that yes, you have favorite the ad, right? Uh, so in this case, uh, if favorite service is down, you won't be able to see your favorite information. But instead of that, we can implement CQRS design pattern, uh, which CQRS stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation. What it tells you is to create a read-only replica uh, uh, database, uh, which supports the query that you want to perform. And uh, your microservice will be responsible for uh, uh, listening to the domain events produced by the owner service. So if we implement CQRS in this scenario, what we can do is we can uh, consume the events produced by the favorite service after the user has favorite the ad and locally store or cache the information, favorite information in the ad service. And this way, we don't have to be dependent on the favorite service uh, to uh, show, uh, get the favorite information when showing the listing. But this also introduces eventual consistency in our systems. And we have to build clients that are smart uh, to account for such inconsistencies. Uh, no vertical can impact the stability of one another. Uh, how many of you here uh, ha know about Conway's law? Okay. Can someone just give a brief of what you understand about Conway's law? Pardon? Yeah. Oh, absolutely right. Yeah. So Conway said uh, that uh, any organization that designs a system will produce a design whose structure is a copy of organization's communication structure. He said this in, uh, you know, I think 1967 and submitted it to Harvard Business Review, and they rejected it. Uh, but uh, I think uh, in 2000s, uh, Harvard Business Review managed to uh, do a survey and was able to prove uh, Conway's law. Also, Eric Raymond says the same thing, uh, that if you uh, have four people, four people or four teams working on a compiler, uh, you will get a four-pass compiler. Uh, so at Dubizel, uh, our business uh, is aligned um, along this vertical, and it thinks in terms of vertical. Also, our teams uh, thinks in terms of vertical, and our management thinks in terms of vertical. So why not uh, we embrace the law in how we build the things? Uh, it's OK to have shared services. There is no harm. But as long as it has clear owners and no vertical-specific logic, in old days, uh, we were fighting against Conway's law. We were building uh, uh, inheritance hierarchies, uh, and we wanted to be dry. Uh, but uh, it actually increased uh, complexity in our system because uh, the vertical-specific logic uh, uh, was all over the place. And uh, it, it's you know complex to build good ab abstraction. And many cases, you know. 
you have a release uh, that you have to do, and some engineer will just add a if statement in the base class and just get it done. And it will lead to poor and immature abstractions. And yeah, so instead of doing that, uh, we can just separate this vertical, se build separate services that does not have, uh, that has only that vertical specific logic. And in case if something is going to be uh, shared by all the verticals, which means shared by all the categories, we can build a horizontal service uh, that uh, does not have any vertical specific information. Um, bounded context are defined by business RIAM, not CRUD APIs. So around three years back, we built a build the place and add functionality in a generic manner. Uh, now today, as our business grows, we want to uh, have more vertical specific, more uh, vertical specific user experience tailored to our users, uh, and we want each vertical to tailor the experience differently uh, as per the needs of their own users, like placing an ad for property and placing an ad for a used car is completely different, and the, the customers are also different. The person, uh, most of our customers who are trying to sell properties on Dubizel uh, are real estate agencies, while the people who are trying to sell cars on Dubizel, um, a lot of people, like 50% of population is uh, C, are C2C users. So yeah, we want to uh, optimize and uh, you know tailor our experience towards our user. But uh, when you, if you do user API and add API, it does not encapsulate what's happening in the real world. Uh, people are registering, saving searches, uh, and we started uh, to think uh, more about bounded context as business realms, uh, uh, not as uh, the ad as a business realm. And so yeah, we should have a business context basically as a first class citizen not uh, the ad creation as a first class, I mean, not the ad entity as whole as a first class citizen. Um, so today, in 2018, uh, we have uh, moved completely to an event-driven architecture where most of our communication happens via message bus. This event uh, bus allows us to decouple our systems and as well as the sidecar model that we have to, you know, send the messages in the background, provide us stability that we desire. Since our APIs are no longer CRUD-based, uh, uh, the degradation of service doesn't happen because of the synchronous network calls. And the testament of this architecture has been uh, when our monolith went down, but our property vertical was completely up and functional uh, during this downtime. Um, uh, also, uh, when building a microservice architecture, observability uh, plays a key role because a lot of stuff is happening in background. So I'll just quickly talk about uh, uh, what strategy Dubizel adapted towards observability. A lot of stuff that we do to achieve observability has been inspired from this book uh, called Google SRE and the four golden uh, signals that are mentioned there. Uh, so, uh, we use uh, New Relic for application performance monitoring and error reporting. Uh, it also allows us to do distributed tracing for all the synchronous uh, interactions that are happening between the services. Uh, these New Relic alerts are routed to PagerDuty, uh, and PagerDuty is uh, further responsible for sending uh, and notifying the people who are responsible and the owners of this component. We use, uh, like every other organization, we use ELK stack for logging. Uh, these logs are propagated to Elasticsearch via Logstash. We also have some alerts configured there, uh, but these alerts are more, more business specific, some things that cannot be, that are not alerts, uh, but are sent to ELK, which are logs, and we want to have some alerts on them. Uh, also, these alerts can be routed via PagerDuty or Slack. Most of cases, we send these alerts on Slack uh, because uh, we don't want to jam PagerDuty and send a lot, lot of not calls to the people who are on call because if we do that, people will start getting annoyed and won't answer the calls of PagerDuty. Uh, 
for infrastructure monitoring, since we are on Amazon, uh, we use uh, Amazon CloudWatch, uh, and we send it to PagerDuty as well, and PagerDuty routes to the respective people. Uh, for cron jobs and background tasks, uh, our alerts looks like this, or if PagerDuty calls you, it tells you there is some issue with your cron job. And uh, uh, we have uh, integrated uh, alerting for cron jobs in our uh, Kronos. We use uh, Mesosphere for container orchestration, and we use Kronos for running crons, scheduling crons. So we have put uh, these alerts in Kronos itself. So every new cron job that we deployed, deploy, uh, the status is recorded, and we can configure the alert that if this cron job fails, please notify the people so that they can act or react. Uh, uh, sorry, this was Q alarms. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, since a lot of communication is happening via bus, uh, and things are in RabbitMQ, uh, we need to make sure that the queue doesn't get full. Uh, there, are case, there have been cases where the consumer died, or the, uh, there was lo just a lot of load or a lot of traffic, and the consumers uh, were scaled to a limit, and the mess there was a lot of messages in the queue. So at that time, it is important to notify people that please uh, scale the consumers further, or look at it why these consumers are stuck and wh why these messages are stuck. As I said about the cron job, uh, we have integrated it in the Kronos. Uh, then we have built a small in-house tool called Telemetry. It is uh, based on, so we use InfluxDB, Grafana, uh, and Redis for that. Uh, why Redis? Because we don't want to put heavy load on InfluxDB because uh, it might go down and we might lose some data. We don't want that. So we send it to Redis. Then we have uh, a small service uh, called Telemetry Collector uh, that runs and uh, takes the data from Redis and puts it into InfluxDB. And uh, then we have some uh, co code in Telemetry that automatically generates the dashboard for the matrix that you send. And after that, you can just go there to Grafana and configure your alerts. So. Be, uh, a telemetry out of the box provides us uh, ability to see the time lag for the messages. So time lag is uh, basically consumed time minus uh, the time at which the message was produced. Uh, then you can monitor the execution time. So after the message has been consumed, how much time did it take to get processed? Uh, you can monitor the size of messages. So there have been instances uh, where our consumers were acting weird because of uh, heavy size of messages, or the consumer just crashed because it didn't have enough memory to pr process that message. Uh, so we integrated uh, ability to see the mo message size. And in case if the message is st struck because of lack of memory, uh, we can vertically scale the consumer and let the message flow. Uh, we can monitor the throughput, uh, as it's also very important. Uh, and uh, also, uh, we can monitor uh, the matrix produced by the crons, uh, their success, failure, and the execution time, etc. cetera. Uh, also, telemetry offers a, a low-level API uh, to send the matrix and generate dashboards. Uh, so it provides you two methods, basically, uh, a record point. So record point allows you to uh, send a matrix uh, uh, just like, you know, uh, counts or numbers. If you want uh, some more information, you can use record data. You can put UUIDs or even email address, whatever you want. It's like logger.info. Just put whatever you like. Uh, and uh, uh, Grafana will have the dashboards for the matrix that you are sending automatically. And you, know, you can configure the alerts, or you can modify the dashboards that are generated, because not every time uh, the dashboard that is automatically generated might tailor all the needs that you have. Um, so just to summarize, uh, these were the things uh, that helped us uh, through the phase of trans transformation. Uh, so bounded context clear, helps us to clearly separate business context and user context. 
Eventual consistency helps us in decoupling our domain and context. Uh, there is a decoupling in a way where producer is not uh, aware about the consumer uh, who is consuming the event, and this makes the system very extendable. Moving to microservice-based architecture is a cultural shift, so developer training is essential. Uh, developer education and em empowerment is an important step in making this transition successful. When migrating to new architecture, it is necessary to reduce the known and unknowns. So we have standardized the tooling and have built, have built the tooling in a way that it interacts with the frameworks and tech stack that we use so that you know it, it might not happen that uh, uh, two services have different way of sending matrix to influx DBs. That's why we build telemetry. So similarly, we have tooling in place to make sure that you know uh, we can reduce uh, knowns and unknowns. Uh, yeah, questions. Yeah. Uh, for SimpleRS, did you actually you work with yourself, or are you using Uh We implemented it ourselves. Yeah. Uh, so uh, before getting to microservice-based architecture, this was our architecture. We were service-oriented architecture. So it for, we started as a very spaghetti code base, and then uh, we did, at that time microservices were in boom. So we said, uh, you know, let's do microservices, but this architecture resulted into, uh, you know, uh, the one that is there on the left side. Uh, a service-oriented architecture because uh, a microservice architecture th system should not be dependent on each other for uptime and availability, uh, while in service-oriented architecture, your services can rely on up other systems for its uptime and availability. It's just the things are separate. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So we st we always have been with Python throughout our journey, and most of our services are written in Python. Uh, the message bus, we use RabbitMQ. And we have built a small abstraction on top of the messaging library called Komsari uh, that d does hide a lot of uh, details about uh, how we are sending messages or uh, you know, creating the queues, uh, et cetera. And telemetry integrates well with Komsari. So uh, you know, whenever you are uh, writing any events for your bus, uh, uh, you get uh, these uh, features out of the box, uh, like uh, knowing the message sizes or a throughput or the organized execution time, et cetera. You just have to add a decorator, uh, record Komsari, and it will do the job for you. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, small question. Did you have versioning like you had five versions and all of them were live when you had microservices, or you just moved one to one and you didn't support all of them? What version? Different versions, yes. Yeah? So or you've changed something and hmm. supported previous one? Yeah, we had to do that for our mobile apps. Uh, so, Did you have any specific problems like um, Yes. Um, of course, API versioning can get tedious. And there, there were scenarios where uh, we broke the backwards compatibility. But then we added uh, tests uh, as much as possible to make sure that we don't break the backwards compatibility. But you supported each microservice to be compatible with each version? But so these services were interacting internally. And for our mobile apps, we had a mobile gateway uh, called, uh, called Combi. And that was taking care of the low level details. So the apps were not, so as you can see, mobile API. Uh, so th that was uh, connecting all the services for the mobile apps. And our web uh, was. Uh, uh, so, uh, web can be changed. We don't need backwards compatibility for that. So, yeah. Any other questions? Um, last but not least, 
uh, thank you. And we are hiring, so <laughs> uh, we are doing doing some cool tech stuff. And if you are interested in disrupting how classified industry works, please get in touch. I would be happy to share the opportunities that we have. We are hiring Python engineers, full stack engineers, and mobile engineers. So for all the platforms we are hiring. So yeah, thank you very much, guys, for listening.